Welcome to the Draft Deeper Podcast. This is your host, Nathan Grubel. Joining me as always is my producer, Kevin Black. An awesome week lined up here on the Draft Deeper Podcast feed. I've talked about doing this for a while, and I'm finally finishing the task at hand. We're getting the rest of my No Ceilings cohorts back on the podcast here to talk about their guys for the 2022 NBA draft cycle. You've you've read all of our words. Hopefully, at least you have by now over at NoSillingsNBA.com. But in case you haven't, I always want to get different perspectives on this show. And I do work with the best staff I could possibly have in the business. I can say that honestly and truthfully. There are so many incredible viewpoints that are going to be shared over the next few days on this podcast feed. And coming back, making a return, we're, we're, we're talking about one guy, at least, that we already talked about previously. But... I feel like it's important to, to hammer home the Johnny Davis points again. If I utter the name Johnny Davis, you know who's coming on this podcast feed. If you know us and know so, it's, it's Tyler Metcalf, co-host of the No Ceilings NBA podcast. Um, honestly, Tyler, I'll, I'll give you the intro and I'll kick it over to you, see how you're doing in a second. But I, I wanted to start off the success we've been having on all of our podcast feeds and No Ceilings lately has been astronomically enormous. And to, for, to see you and Rucker get the No Ceilings NBA feed to where you guys have in about six months, essentially matching what it's taken me, scratching and clawing two years to get to where I am right now, it's I, I can't say enough good things about what you guys are doing over on that feed. I hope that everyone who listens to me, I, I would assume that they're obviously subscribed to the No Ceilings NBA podcast feed, but you guys are a delight every single week. You get on guests, and even when it's just you two, the bickering that can go on sometimes back and forth is amazing to be able to listen to. So just, just wanted to start off with that, man. Seriously, congratulations for everything you guys are doing over on that feed. And I'm, I'm proud to be working so close with you and especially having you on today. How you doing, buddy? I'm fantastic. I, I, I appreciate the kind words. Um, Rucker and I are like an old married couple already <laughs> over there. Um, well, you know, we're, we're, we're going to need a healthy break after, after the yes. draft is over. We're, but, we're all um, going to need a healthy break. Yes. <laughs> but yes. no, I, the, the, the support for everything we're doing at no ceilings this year has been humbling. It's been incredible. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the people who interact with us, who support us in any way they can, it's been absolutely incredible this year. And, you know, the, the podcast has, been a lot of fun um but you know it's a collective effort it's a, you know just because not everyone's on every episode it's because they're promoting it they're sharing insights they're bouncing ideas off each other behind the scenes so R- rucker and i are typically the the main voices that you hear in your ears every day with that but it, it it's all of us doing it and it definitely wouldn't have reached the heights that it has this year without it being a group effort so i i'm just the, the, the entire support we've received as a team this year has just been really humbling, incredible, overwhelming, you know, just, and it ha- has not gone unnoticed by any of us. We, we do constantly bounce ideas off of each other in our group chat all the time, except it, it is very rare when I don't respond to anybody's messages in there, but I did not respond to your grad school question. The, the other night I was like all right this this is this is over my head right now like I, I I can't respond to this right now Metcalf you're 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 a much smarter individual than I am and I I am never going to help anybody with their grad school homework Ke- Kevin included sorry buddy I'm not smart enough for that you're on your own um but, but you guys you guys work incredibly hard so let's let's do what we're here to do Let's talk about basketball. Let's talk about the NBA draft, but we've done all year long. Everybody's probably sick of us talking about the NBA draft at this point, but we don't care. We're still going to hammer home our points. We're going to talk about our guys. And as I said at the top, Johnny Davis is the first guy that we're going to talk about tonight. One of Metcalf's guys all year long. He helped come on what I dubbed draft deeper as Johnny Davis week. Him and Nick came on for for an awesome episode, and we broke down some of his game then. But really, Tyler, I can't understand what's happened with with Johnny Davis' stocks basically since then. Um, I know that you you and Nick kind of see him at at least in a race, and I guess Albert's really thrown himself into the ring now as well as having Johnny Davis as possibly the best guard in this draft class. But even if you don't have him, like me, for example, have him as the best guard, I still have him in my top six. I can't, I can't figure out why 
people are putting out some of the negative things that they are saying about his draft stock, that they're pitching him closer all the way from 10 to I think Kevin O'Connor had the, the mock draft update for the ringer. He had him at 14 today to the Cavs. And like that, if he slides that far, like what, what are, what are we doing? And it's, it's something that I came back to. I messaged you guys in the group chat about two hours ago the, from when we we're recording this, I said that, one of my bigger regrets with my big board could be having Shane Sharp as high as I do. And I know some people might be like, you have him at eight. That's not really like that high. But just this notion that we're going to have somebody who has more question marks, is more unknown than somebody like a Johnny Davis, for example, who has a legitimate resume. And that's what I wanted to hit home with Rucker on the last pod, that, that all of Jay and Ivy, Keegan Murray, and Johnny Davis have legitimate big 10 resumes where they were mm-hmm. in, they were part of archaic offenses. They had to go up against these defensive schemes that are just double team, triple team blitz. And you're not making anything easy on one-on-one players. Like the fact that those three guys had the success that they did this year is remarkable to me. And it's why I cannot have them any lower than where I have them on my board. But I've, I've talked about Johnny Davis a bunch. I've said enough kind words about his game over the last few weeks. I want you to really hit it home one more time for my audience. Why should they be higher on Johnny Davis than they probably are right this very second? Well, he's just an incredible basketball player. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I know that sounds lame and boring and lazy, but it, it's really just that simple with him. He does a little bit of everything at an extremely high level. And if you took Johnny Davis off that Wisconsin team, they're barely making the Big Ten tournament, let alone the NCAA tournament. They were that bad of a team. And I keep seeing all these clips of, oh my God, look at this bad turnover by Johnny. Or look at this contested mid-range pull-up. Why didn't he kick it out to this guy in the corner? It's like, well, maybe because that guy is an 8% three-point shooter. That's probably why he didn't kick it out. Uh, well, why, why did he turn the ball over here? I don't know. Maybe be, maybe because he's being quadruple teamed. That happens. Yeah. Like, I'm not comparing them as players because I think, you know, Cade is a significantly better player than Johnny is. But their situations were really similar, where they were the alpha and omega of everything that team had to do, and they weren't surrounded by any shooters. So if you want to knock him for not having a good for not having good assist numbers, okay. But just when you do that, please understand that assists are a two person stat and you have to have someone who makes a shot after you pass it to them and if they don't you don't get an assist so how many times fact, have we seen on the film like those awesome baseline kicks that yeah. he does out to the opposite corner like and, and, and he does it with both hands passes. yeah ambidextrous yeah. yep yeah that, that that that's what's most fascinating to me about his offense is how effortlessly he controls the ball with either hand whether he's passing shooting um, you know, throwing up a floater, finishing at the rim. It's all really soft touch, really accurate, really consistent with both hands. And I think that's such an under discussed or underappreciated skill that he shows on a game by game basis. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the mid range shooting and scoring is what it is. I love it. It's a little bit of a throwback. Um, I get that it's not the most efficient shot, but for some guys it is. And every playoffs, we see guys thrive in the mid range and those who don't, you know, they're, they're, they're a little easier to scheme against. So yeah, I would like to see him get to the rim a little more instead of a, you know, take away some of those mid range pull-ups. But when you're playing with two non-shooting bigs who are on either block, the paint gets really crowded really quickly. So I just offensively, he's not going to be a 35 usage guy in the NBA. That's not who he, he is. So people need to stop envisioning him as that yeah. there are, four guys in the league who have that Johnny Davis isn't going to be that it's not going to be the exact same role. And I think what's most encouraging is that we've seen him succeed at lesser roles where his freshman year at Wisconsin, he came off the bench in every single game. He didn't put up huge numbers, but he played hard defense. He scored where he needed to. He moved the ball. He was a productive player to the point where, you know, even as a, even during his freshman year, I'm like, okay, this guy's a guy for the future, not, I didn't see this. Like, I, I'm just going to be honest. I did not see I, I don't think anybody saw, saw this, but. But I, I thought he was going to be a guy who played in the NBA one day. And then we saw him in FIBA and he took on more of an on-ball role somewhere in between what he did his freshman and sophomore year. Um, and he was still really effective. So he's just one of these really smart, hardworking players who can do a bit of everything and will fill whatever role his coach or his team needs him to fill. 
there's there's two things really that, that I took away when I got to see him live. Um, well, when I pop, popped over to Rutgers for a game, their game against Wisconsin, the first thing that I shared with all of you guys in the group chat immediately was I've never seen somebody have the, the same demeanor that I saw from him as a college prospect before the game. Like that dude, just the aura that was coming off of him, it felt like he wanted to kill somebody on the court. Like I was like, oh my God, he is intense. He's locked in. This guy is ready to battle. And he did that every single night in the Big Ten, but you saw it from the warmups and then obviously translating into the game that, that he is locked in. He's mentally tough. He's prepared. So that was the first thing that stood out to me. And the other thing, we highlighted some of the passing. I'm sure we can talk about some of the defense in the backcourt as well. Mm-hmm. But the third thing, as far as his game that I wanted to see was, could he, did it look as hard for him to create separation on some of those mid-range shots that he likes to live off of as it does on tape? Or does it look a little more natural in person? Is it actually as hard as it might look sometimes? And it was not hard for him at all against a really, really good Rutgers defense. Like mm-hmm. that team played menacing defense at the trapezoid of terror, as they like to call it over in, in New Jersey. That was one of the better defensive teams in the big 10 this year. And Johnny Davis was, especially in the second half, getting whatever he needed to get for his team. Um, and, and even though he had some of these nights where he wasn't shooting the most efficient from the floor, just some of the shots that he was still able to create, the angles he's able to get some of those pull-ups off from, how when he does get to the basket, he can finish with either hand as you talked about. Man, we don't see mid-range guys like him as much Mm -hmm. at at this point in their careers. And it's something I wanted to highlight early on when we were talking about the buzz in the season is that it really impresses me when a guy can get to 20 plus points per game and he doesn't have to do it shooting five, six, seven, eight threes a game right? Like there were some games Mm -hmm. where he still got the 20 plus because he got to the line and he only shot like two three-point attempts or three three three-point attempts. That speaks volumes to me because those, it's a lot easier to get an open three-point shot in the NBA with how spacing is today, but for him to be able to do some of the big ridge things and, and showcase a level of separation, level of poise, confidence in getting to those spots that I know is going to translate to the NBA that speaks volumes to me and in ways that, that some of these pull-up scores um, from three-point range, they, they don't speak to me in the same way as like the polish that, that, that Johnny's game does to me, at least personally. That, that, that was one of my most impressive takeaways from Santa. Yeah, and the, everyone always harps on the three-point percentage, but everyone gets better as a shooter as they get yeah. older and get into the NBA. I'm not worried about it. If he just – his ability to develop a quality standstill spot up three point jumper off the catch. I have way more faith in that than some other guys developing dynamic dribble creation or on ball creation that they haven't showed ever. So I I don't understand where that disconnect is coming from. And then just the, the variety of his scoring game inside the arc, I thought was just one of the most impressive things in college basketball. You talked about how effectively he got to his spots in the mid range, but I knew it was through, you know, it it wasn't just, okay, let me dribble left and step back. Yes. He had a lot of mid range step backs, but then he would also use a shot fake spin the other way and then hit a floater. He would, you know, put his shoulder into his defender and quickly rise up to throw off their timing. So they couldn't really contest it. He would snake off a pick and roll and, you know, split the rotating defense and finish with his left hand on a reverse. It's like, Holy crap. Like the, the different stuff he's doing every night is astonishing. And then when you think about Okay, how is that going to translate to the NBA? Because that's what this is all about. Yes, we, you know, we we wouldn't do this if we didn't enjoy at least some aspects of watching college basketball. But the whole point of this is what are they going to be like in the NBA? When you improve the spacing, when you put him next to a more ball dominant guard or wing or someone who's going to be an actual number one, think about how he's able to get to his spots when the ball swings and he's attacking closeouts, when he's that second side creator, when he's not the primary option and he isn't, you know, expending a thousand percent of his energy on every single possession. It's like, why is he going to be the first guy who doesn't benefit from improved spacing? I just, I, I just don't get it because everything he showed was versatility on offense with scoring in the post, scoring out of the pick and roll, mid-range pull-ups, uh, floaters, cuts, 
off ball movement. Like he moves the ball. He's not, yeah. There are some possessions where it's stuck with him a little longer than you would want it to, but I think that's context. And if you don't acknowledge the context and the situation and who they're playing with and who they're playing against in the game, the, that specific game situation, you lose so much of what you're actually looking at. I also don't think anybody was banging the drum for the type of offense that Wisconsin was running all year either. You mean the one that they've been running since the eighties? Yeah. It's, it's not (laughs) great. It's probably going to get a little more inventive with, with screen setting in the NBA form as well, which basically anytime you gave Johnny Davis a screen, he he was almost automatic. You look up all the synergy percentiles, you, you go back and you dig through the film. Like anytime you set a screen for him at the top, he was able to make something happen. And he's only going to be involved in more of those actions in the NBA. And that's the kind of stuff that cap, I, I, I don't know where I, I think you, you, you've done a really good job at setting the scene for Johnny Davis can be a, a really good player in the NBA. Maybe he's not a great player, but th- those are some of the things that remind me of like the Devin Booker comparisons. And it's like, you know, Devin Booker really isn't this high volume three point guy either. We, we thought he was going to be coming out of Kentucky and like mm-hmm. his first year. And then I remember watching him in summer league, like him going into his second year, like he wanted to take a lot of threes, but that ultimately wasn't where his game fell. His game fell. And at his best, he really is being utilized in a lot of the same ways that I, I could envision Johnny being utilized. Now, whether Johnny actually reaches that level of plateau as a score in terms of efficiency, that that remains to be seen, but like, I can, I can see Johnny being used in a lot of the same ways. And I think that that's really where I think that comparison needs to be hit home. If, if I can, if I can envision something like that, he's got to be higher on people's draft boards. Like in, in my opinion, he has to be. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, it, him and Keegan are kind of similar in how the, in the way that they approach the game too. Oh, Ke- where... Keegan too. He's going to benefit so much from that NBA space as well. That you talked about yeah. And, and the, they're just, they're two guys who just constantly execute things at an extremely high level, every possession on both ends of the floor. So, you know, it's when you're not running an offense that's 50 years old and was considered outdated when I was growing up learning it, <laughs> And like, just to, to show my age, I'm 30 now. So we're talking about, it's been, they've been running the same crap for a long time and they've been constructing teams the same way for a long time. So when you actually give him a point guard or literally anyone else on the floor who can create their own shot, his life is just going to become so much easier on offense. And then I think we're even going to see his defense shine to even another level, which is really saying something because he was extremely, extraordinary as a defender this year were you surprised at all when he measured in how like how well that he actually measured in that because like I saw him up up close and I I didn't think he was like six four but I I didn't think he was closer to six six than six five I guess would be how I would put it like that that surprised me and I think that bodes even better for his defense because I think that he's only going to continue to get bigger and stronger in the Mm -hmm. NBA he has the height he has he doesn't have like quote-unquote plus length he has enough length um, I think he's going to be able to guard one through three in, in the NBA. And I think that's something I don't know. A lot of people had confidence that he would be able to do that like two months ago before some of the measurements came in. Like that, did that surprise you at all? And you kind of feel the same way. Um, Maybe just like the raw number surprised me a little bit, but I, I was never really concerned about his defensive versatility because he switched a lot in college and at Wisconsin and you know obviously you don't want him defending guys in the post but even when he would get switched on to like a Travion Williams or Trace Jackson Davis or just some opposing big he would get low and take away their you know center of gravity he would get into their thighs and move them and he really showed how willing he was to battle and you know, compete at that end, every yep. single possession. And that's just something we don't get from guys who had that same usage rate on offense and even guys who had the lesser usage rate for rate as that. So I think it's just a real testament to, you know, I hate talking too much about intangibles because we don't know these guys. We haven't met them. We, you know, um, but I think we've heard what, all the same things though. Every single person right. who's done like a real story, a real interview with Johnny Davis and his family, they've all said the same things. Every one of them. Yeah. And just looking at what we just saw on the court, 
Well, you yeah. see how competitive he is. You see how tough he is. You see how much he wants to win and he'll do whatever is needed to do that. And I just, you don't get that from a lot of prospects. And I just love that he took on that offensive workload and didn't bat an eye when he was asked to defend at the level he did. I still don't think there, and, and I, I know I've said this repeatedly too, but I, I'll say it one more time before we actually get the draft now. Like, I don't think there's another lottery prospect who we have ranked that, that we can point to and be like, that guy had to carry as much of a load on both ends of the floor as Johnny had to. I think he had the biggest load of any lottery prospect. Yeah, no, I, I, I fully agree. Um, I, you know, I think Keegan would probably be close there, but Keegan was also surrounded by a bunch of shooters and, you know, that Iowa team isn't afraid to let it fly. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I think Keegan would probably be the closest. Just I think he, head, he might he might Johnny have had as ahead. much offensive responsibility. I don't think he had sure. the same defensive responsibility though. Like Johnny yeah, well, had to consistently guard the best defense, the best perimeter player on the opposing team every night. So yeah, and and no one on Iowa really had any defensive <laughs> responsibility. So <laughs> oh man, it was like they they were you were either really good at defense from a team perspective in the Big Ten, or you were like piss poor, like Nebraska. <laughs> Oh boy. So sp- speaking of other Big Ten players, you wanted to talk about Max Christie out of Michigan State. I, I did end up having him in the first round rankings on my board. Somebody who you can make a case for him, which I, I think you're probably going to do, and then taking him in the top 20. You can make a case for him being a back half first guy. You can make a case for him being like if he falls to the early second. Like he has a wide range, and I, I could see him being picked any number of spots on draft night, but he is one of these bigger guards slash wings. Um, He does measure out really well in terms of size and length. If he is who we project him to be, which is a a three and D wing at six, six who can play both sides of the ball really did defend his ass off for a lot of the year in Michigan state. I don't think a lot of people realize that I'm sure you're going to touch on that in a second, but if he is bringing that sweet stroke, if he is able to make things happen, you know, handling the ball as a secondary ball handler off screens, you know, getting downhill, getting to that floater that he does have when he gets two feet in the paint. Like there's a lot of parts to his game that can come together to make him a starting caliber player in the NBA. And I think just because some of the percentages weren't there for him in his first year in college, a lot of people wanted to write him off. But if you watch the film and you use your imagination as to where the NBA is going and what they want to have in terms of size and length and perimeter skill at all positions on the floor, Max Christie fits into exactly what you want to project. So I was not as high on him in the end as you were, but that doesn't mean that I don't want to listen to your, I know brilliant case that you're about to make for Max Christie. So go ahead. Why is he one of your guys for this draft? I'm sorry. Now he's going to finish him inside my top 20 um, of prospects. And I think he's going to end up going a lot higher than a lot of people think on draft night. Um, I'm not reporting anything. We don't do that. I'm just reading the tea leaves. We are not but reporters. We get intel. Ever, we are not ever, reporters. Ever. I ne- never take anything I say as a report. Um, I'm just aggregators. Don't aggregate this. <laughs> um, so I, I, I thought it was really interesting that he declared that he was 100% staying in when he did. And it was well before the deadline. It was almost right after the combine. So I think a guy like that who would have a promising situation to go back to, I think he had a lot of really positive feedback coming out of the combine and a lot of first round, you know, I don't want to say promises, but for lack of a better word, promises. So it wouldn't surprise me if he goes top 20. Um, He was in the lottery for me most of the year. And a lot of it is just betting on the talent. The, you, you kind of outlined his, um, you know, his framework as a player earlier. And that size, that two-way versatility is exactly what every single NBA rotation looks for in the NBA. And if you can get that in the teens or twenties, that it's going to be really promising and really encouraging and incredible value. So I I said this about Usman Zhang, where I think Zhang's rookie year is going to be a disaster and it won't deter me at all because the start of his NBL year was some of the worst basketball we saw all season. Yeah. And I think, I think Christie's rookie year is going to be similar where he's really going to struggle with the speed, the physicality of the NBA. 
he kind of he kind of did that this year at Michigan State, where a lot of the issues that he had, it looked like he was almost panicking and like the game was a little too fast for yeah. him. That's to be expected when you make those jumps. So I don't expect him to be a good rookie. But what he did all season was he kept working. He kept he kept improving throughout the year, um, and he never lost the faith of his coaching staff or his teammates because they kept swinging him the ball. They kept trusting him on defense. They kept talking to him on rotations and he kept starting. I think that says a lot because Tom Izzo is a guy who will bench you if you suck. And if you're not working, if you're not putting in the work to improve and get better, you will be done. So I know a lot of, none of this is very encouraging for how I'm about to sell him, but I, I think the percentages aren't a great indicator of who he'll be as a shooter. I think as he gets stronger, that will only those percentages will only improve. I really like his form, the foundation of it. Um, and then I really like the way he moves off ball. The way he relocates is just second nature to him. He finds those open pockets on the perimeter. He runs off screens really well and just kind of curls off to those mid-range pull-ups or even just sinks down into the corner when his guy's trying to go over the top of a screen. So he, he just has a really high awareness of where to find those open spots on the floor um and he then defensive- had to be that guy though i mean like to his credit yeah. like there weren't really a lot of other guards in the roster who are like i'm gonna be this amazing guy creating something for somebody else right like they had a lot of like they had a few guards but they had a lot of these like rangy wings and you throw the bigs like marcus bingham like they can do things when they have the ball in their hands but it's more so for themselves not creating for others so like max kind of had to learn how to create for himself and, and get himself open right yeah, and I, I, I really like Jaden Akins this next year, but like him and AJ Hogard are more defensive guys who, yeah. you know, they're they're not shooters and not out there really pressuring the defense from a scoring standpoint. But I it was just really interesting the way he moved, the way they kept running stuff for him. So I, I, I think his shooting case is going to kind of mirror Zaire Williams um a lot, where they're these really Sorry, skinny Tom. guys who you know, I, obviously Zaire is a little taller, but they're these skinny guys who struggle to score efficiently, even though the shots looked good. And then as they get into the NBA training, they improve their core strength, they improve their upper body strength, they improve their lower body strength. That shooting effectiveness and accuracy and consistency is just only going to improve. How do you like his footwork? I actually really loved his feet on both sides of the ball. And I think that's like a major selling point for him that you outlined perfectly. He's, he only weighed in at about 190, 195 pounds. He's going to have to get stronger given the positions he'll play. But we also really like to look for footwork on both sides of the ball. Some of these prospects and I loved it. I loved it on both ends. Yeah. I, I adored his footwork. Um, when Rucker and I were talking about him earlier this year, um, you know, we, we said it was Mikhail Bridges-esque. I, I don't think he's going to be as good of a defender as Bridges, but the way sure. he moves on the perimeter, it's really similar to that where he's just sliding his feet. He's accepting contact. He's cutting yep. off drives. So he, even though he's skinny, I, I think he will get stronger, but he doesn't play soft. And that that that's always the big concern with me with these skinny guys is, okay, are they avoiding contact or are they initiating contact? And defensively, that was huge for him where he would slide and cut off guys and put his chest into guys and beat them to spots. Um, he really used his length and his feet just incredibly well. Um, now to, to counter that Malachi Branham did cook him uh, that one game, but I think that's more of a testament to how promising Matt Branham is yep. on offense than an indictment for Christie. My only concern with Christie's footwork is that he's a little slow going to his left um so whether that's just a fundamental thing or just a processing thing um you know i'm I'm not quite sure but that that was about it otherwise i the way he flips his hips the way he keeps his feet and his hips connected um he's just really always on balance and they're really quick when he does have to change directions listen man you, you and I both know Malachi Brandon cooked a lot of people in the second half of the year. And that's, that's why Malachi yeah. Brandon is in, is in the lottery for me. I, I wouldn't blame anybody for taking a swing on, on Christie in like a top 20 range, top 25 range. I'm putting you a little bit on the spot. I didn't ask you for any of your quote unquote ideal fits for Johnny Davis, but I'll, is there anything, maybe, maybe you don't have to give me a specific team if one doesn't jump out of you, but like any, any situation that might speak to you a little bit in terms of like where you'd like to see Matt Christie go on draft night. Oh boy. Um, 
I know, F- 17 to Houston, I, I honestly wouldn't hate because they just give him time to kind of develop and get ready. Uh, San Antonio at 20. Yeah. That'd be a uh, great one. Milwaukee at 24 I really like San Antonio at 25 um and then like even Miami at 27 I think would be a lot of fun um because San Antonio I, I makes a ton of sense and it's, yeah. it's it's for the same reasons that that I set up when, when Rucker and I were talking about AJ Griffin and possible fits for him it's for the same reason that San Antonio has a lot of guys who can kind of do things and, and create off the dribble, but they don't have too many guys who are like standstill shooters who we're confident, like you're going to be there like two, three years from now. And Max Christie can be one of those guys who he can be a knockdown catch and shoot guy. And then he still adds into everything that the team wants to do from a defensive standpoint. I like that fit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he, he, he just excels at his role or, you know, tries to excel at his role. I know there'll be pushback but given his percentages. We're like, Ooh, how, how much did he really excel? It's like, sh- shut up. Um, but, you know, he, he's that guy who will play his role. He will excel in that role. He will do what the team needs him to do. It's, it's just a really similar approach to Johnny. And, you know, I, you didn't ask for it, but I, I love Johnny in San Antonio too. What about, so John, Johnny in San Antonio, what about, I, I still love the Johnny in New Orleans fit, man. And like, there's a lot of guys who we can argue for, for New Orleans, but I, I think if Johnny was surrounded by three guys who you can argue are number one offensive option at all times, like all the pressures off of him, he can be an off ball guard. And I think, man, his game would really hum in a situation like that. Like Washington's a popular fit for him. I think the New York thing, as much as you might not want him to go to the Knicks, I think the New York thing might, might still be good because he yeah. you know he'll come in he'll work his ass up on defense tip will trust him on that end to play him minutes and then offensively i think he could work off some of those other guys so i there there's multiple fits but man yeah that new orleans fit would be amazing for for johnny but metcalf i'm I'm a little disappointed you didn't choose Mark Williams to talk about after I was, I said this on another podcast. I I mean, we, can. I, we can, we can. I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to talk about Mark. I was doing a fist pop when you were going at some people on social media the other day. I was like, my guy, like going to war for Mark Williams. You, you didn't take anybody's shit. I took some shit because I, I tried to post something positive about Mark Williams like a month ago and I the draft Twitter just absolutely slaughtered me. And I was like, what? why yeah yeah can we can we can we talk about can you give like your mark williams and passion case really quick for for my audience because like it well i don't get why he gets so much crap and like i i sort of do because i was i was admittedly i was late to the party and no still was coming around on him like i kind of had him as like a back first guy then i started moving him like all right can he be like a top 20 guy and then i finally was just like screw it i'm moving him up to the lottery because i just bigs who come around who are as efficient with what they do on both sides of the ball those are the types of big men that everybody's looking for nowadays in the nba and like they're as rucker said i, I agree with him as well there's there's certain parts of his game that he doesn't have at least not right now that like robert mm-hmm. williams has developed in the nba but like mark is the closest thing i think we're going to see in this draft class to like a robert williams type of big man and if that's not enough of a selling point for other people to like move them up their boards and like I, I don't know what is. So like t- talk to my audience, give, give us the positives. Give us the rundown about Mark Williams before moving to the other two guys. I'm sorry. I, I guess my only pushback on him being Robert Williams ask is I, I don't think he's quite as twitchy as Robert Williams. Okay. Is. Um, but I, he's a massive human being and every argument I see against him is that he's not switchable or that he's slow on the perimeter. I think he has some of the best footwork out of any center in this class. He's always on balance. Um, yeah, obviously he's going to get blown by, by some of these six, two guards who blow past everyone. Um, but the way that he moves his feet and uses his length, it doesn't really matter if he's yeah. recovering from behind because his initial movement will bump them wide, making them take a wider arc on their drive and giving him, you know, that extra second to recover. And then his, was it seven, five, seven, seven wingspan? Well, you know, then he just blocks everything at the rim. Not only does he block, you know, almost everything at the rim, he has incredible verticality and he covered up so many warts for that Duke perimeter defense this year, where maybe it was just that scheme where they were just funneling everything to the rim for him to eat up but he did it. So it's even, you know, whether he's cleaning up for their mistakes or being 
schemed for that is just a testament to how reliable and how much trust that team and coaching staff had in his uh, raw defensive abilities. But and oh, oh, by the way, he figured out how to be that guy covering so much ground and covering up for everybody's mistakes while also figuring out how to not foul himself out of games as well. And that's something I love to see from any big man. Can, can you stay out of foul trouble? Can you actually stay on the court? And he, he, did, he did that last year. All year. All year he did that. Yeah, and I think that that lack of fouling shows a, a rim protector's discipline. And because, you know, sure, if you have an extraordinary block rate, but you're racking up four and a half fouls a game, that means you're just chasing every shot. You're going exactly. after everything, every pump fake, you know, you're late on rotations. That's not what Mark was. He moved his feet incredibly well, yep. whether he's rotating from the weak side. I think he can show different coverages in the pick and roll. Obviously, you don't want him switching. I cannot emphasize that enough for the eight millionth time i do not want him switching and if we're comparing him to bam out of bio if that's the standard we're putting then no one's ever going to be a good defensive center coming out of college so i agree just de de defensively i have zero concerns because he's so incredibly smart um he's really disciplined he moves his feet extremely well and then offensively he's just incredibly low maintenance he runs the floor probably the best out of any center in this class in transition um he catches everything he gets early seals he if you want him to screen 20 times in a possession he'll screen 20 times in a possession he it, well some, sometimes he did when coach k would go back to that double drag like three different times and then <laughs> one trip down the floor but carry on carry on yeah it's just he's an elite defender coming out of college he's the most nba ready big man um from day one and he's not going to demand the ball or be high maintenance on offense if he shoots cool i you know that that's great i don't expect him to necessarily mm -hmm. and it also doesn't change my perception of him if he doesn't because he doesn't play in a way that would demand him to be able to shoot because the, de the defense alone puts him ahead of almost every center in this class, but then that ability to run in transition, to dunk everything, to catch everything, to be a really effective screener, it, it's just a really easy to work around and easy to implement offensive skill set. I Listen, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. 72 plus percent from the field, like you throw it up there, he's going to get it. He's, <laughs> he, he, he's going to finish it. And like we... I I have Duran one spot ahead of him on my board because I, I think at the end ahead. I think at the end of the day I'm going to bet on the age I'm going to bet on some of the tools and and if if there is a chance that I can get like somewhat in the realm of a Bam at a bio type center I'm going to take the chance on that guy sure. right but what I've said about Mark Williams is if Duran only ends up being more of what he was last year and he doesn't develop all of the other ancillary skills that we think he's going to develop and we're making a much more closer comparison between him and mark williams mark williams is much better at what those two are right now and if that's the type of player i'm going to get like if all Duran is like a rim runner rebounder like interior shot blocker i'm going to take mark williams over that guy because he was more way more efficient at doing that job than, than what Duran was last year you're going to bet on bet on the upside but sometimes depending on how teams develop these guys sometimes that upside doesn't always take shape and they're, 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 the idea of Duran is fascinating but it's also right now more theoretical than I think people would care to admit Mark Williams isn't theoretical so no no there, there's nothing theoretical about Mark Williams and just like the the comp that I keep going back to and I it's obviously not perfect no comp is um is like he's a almost like a seven two Kevon Looney. And that That's player is so incredibly important. We've seen how important Kevon Looney is all playoffs. Um, he does the dirty work. He's a really good defender. Um, you know, if you give Kevon Looney six, nine, or at least that's what he's listed at like that, that dude plays a lot bigger than he is. If he was yeah. seven, two, think about the rim protection that team has instead. It's incredible. Um, so I, I do have Duran higher on my board by like a couple spots. And that's because like of what you were outlining of what he could be. And I thought the improvements that he showed last year were really important and really encouraging, but he's still got a long way to go um, to be NBA ready. I, I would agree. So let's, let's move on. Let's, let's get back to our regularly scheduled programming tonight. A player who 
This guy showed up on my timeline today. Shout out to Chuck over yeah, at Chucking Darts, who was like, I I finally got around to watching Gabrielle Perchita. I was like, well, welcome to the club, fam. Like, the, I said, no ceilings. We've, we've been on this train all year, and there are no two people who have been even more so on the train than you and Corey. And I, I don't know who's higher on him nowadays. I, I, it used to be Corey, I think, was the highest on him, but you, you flipped him in your rankings. You shot this bad boy way up your board, and – I mean, when you measure in, he measured in, shoot, like 6'8 at the combine, I believe. He's a 6'8 way now, right? Uh, like, maybe 6'7, but in, the, in that range, yeah. He's, he's bigger. He's, I think he's bigger than we all thought. Um, one of the most fascinating guys to watch on tape because of how athletic he is. Good, good Lord. He might be one of the better run and jump wing athletes that we have in this draft class. And it's, it's weird. It's weird to say, we don't always say that about guys coming over from, from Europe in that same category as like some of the, the, the domestic, the U S guys, but man, for Cheetah, Holy cow. He jumps out of the gym. He jumps off the page. He has unbelievable range and touch on a shot from the perimeter there. There are question marks about his game, which I'm sure you'll touch on in a second, but like from, from a wow factor at his size, like why wouldn't somebody want to take a bet on him in, in the NBA draft? So tell the audience where, where you have him on your board. Give us, give us the breakdown of why Pachita has been one of your guys for, for quite a while now. And so I not, I have him at 20 um, and I would easily take him in the first. Um, you have said he's I, the best international player for you on your board. Oh, well, by a lot. Yeah. And then, and, and that's not, that, that, that doesn't count Dyson Daniels or Jeremy Sohan because sure. they played over here this year. I sure. delineate guys by that. Um, but yeah, no, I, Pachita has been the best internet or the top of my international class for six months now. Um, I wrote about him over at no ceilings NBA.com. It's free. Go check it out. Um, <laughs> earlier this year about just his scoring versatility. And he was just one of the most enjoyable watches out of anyone in this yeah. class for me. Um, he his off ball shooting is incredible. He he shoots with movement, reliable standstill, runs off screens really hard. Um, that same thing that we were talking about with Max Christie, where he knows exactly how to run off a screen based on how his guy's trailing him to find that open pocket. He does that even better. And then once he receives the catch, he also has enough ball handling and athleticism to create and attack closeouts. And yeah that ability to attack a closeout drive to the middle of the lane shot fake spin back the other way and knock down a fadeaway it's like that's really freaking hard to do like yep. not a lot of guys can do that and the fact that he has the size that you mentioned that's really important too because that covers up any or a lot of you know any defensive questions that you may have with him he can shoot over all those guys doing, doing the yes. hard closeout on him in the corner he can just shoot over those guys yeah. and the fact and he's that's the big thing for me. Obviously the shooting is what's the selling point. Cause it's like, Holy crap. Look at this dude. Yeah. Elite shooter at six, seven, six, eight. Love it. Okay. Well, elite shooters are really easy to scheme against. If you just have to run them off the line, if you just run them off the line, are they toast or can they do something? Sure. And he can do something. He can attack the rim. He'll finish over guys. He plays with attitude. He can knock down mid range pull-ups. Um, just, I, I have zero concerns about his like long-term scoring game so where do the concerns for you come in with with Prachita? is it more on the defensive side of the ball is it in some of the decision making and shot selection because that's kind of like where where i would lie in terms of why i wouldn't have him as high as you do like where where do your concerns come in with Prachita? so i i'm not too concerned about the defense i think the size covers up a lot of issues Gaps, yeah um i but i mean he, he's competitive he'll jump passing lanes and I, I think he'll be fine. I don't think he's going to be on anyone's short list for all NBA defense, but I also sure. don't think he's going to be a defensive liability. Um, the ball, the kind of lack of ball movement and the inconsistencies in production are kind of the, the, the two biggest concerns sure. for me where some games he would, you know, have player, he would play 28 minutes, be really productive, score, rebound, um, have, have a couple steals. And then the next two games, you'd only play like four or five minutes. So I was like, okay, this is one of those weird European rotation things where young guys yeah. really struggle to get minutes. So that lack of consistent role and consistent minutes, um, 
it, it it's weird you know there who who knows exactly what went into it there are a few things that we could speculate about but when he did get the minutes he generally produced and speaking of getting the minutes i mean for producing and we've had we've had rafael come on his podcast and talk about it like we've had multiple people come on and who are much more familiar with the international game than i am and they've talked about mm -hmm. and this is something i've learned over the years as well it's really hard to get minutes as a young player for these yeah. clubs because these clubs just want to win and there's there's so many more things that go into a club's performance and their upkeep than just the wins and the wins and the losses to just you know have a better record it's everything else with, with the franchise that that goes into winning and losing so these coaches are under the gun to help their franchise win so they can keep their job but also obviously they don't want to probably coach in the same place forever they want to continue to move up in, in the game of basketball as well they want to move on to better opportunities so they they kind of pressure themselves to win so it's not always an environment where young players are always going to have the opportunity to produce but when you do get the opportunity you have to make the most of it and Pachita did a 66.8 true shooting percentage this past year for a 67 true shooter are you kidding me it's kind of good that's <laughs> That's that's kind of good. A 17 PER, 124 offensive rating. Like th those are not numbers that you usually see from a young international prospect. And we're we're not calling him Luca or anything like that. Like, no, 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 no. We're we're not going to do that. But it's important to take note of when somebody is able to produce at the levels that that he showed he was capable of in spurts. You got to move that guy up your board. You have to target him as somebody who. He's worth taking a swing on in the draft. And I'm, I'm glad you import, you highlighted some of those negatives because I think if anybody only listens to the positives that you outlined, they'd be like, why isn't this kid like the top 10 of the draft? It's like, so slow down. He, he's he's got to develop. There's some things that yes. he has to work on. But the promise, the raw talent, it's there. And I think a team's going to take a swing on him. They're going to bring him over. And in a few years from now, they're going to look really damn smart doing so. I think we'd all say that like, there, there's a range at which all of us and no ceilings would take him, but I think all of us are pretty sold on if you draft this kid and you put him in the right developmental system, like he could become a real player in like two to three years. And that's at that position, at that size, that's everything NBA teams want nowadays. Yeah, I know. It, it wouldn't surprise me if he kind of has a similar career progression like Bogdan Bogdanovich, where yep. he goes mid second round. And everyone's like, okay, whatever, another Euro that half of or most of fans who aren't really into the draft have never heard of yep. and he doesn't really get minutes for a year or two and then he just really turns into this offensive dynamo so I would love a team to kind of bring him over and slowly bring him along kind of like the Timberwolves have with uh, Bomaro where he just spent all year in the G League um except on their off nights or whatever, where he would then be on the NBA bench and just kind of slowly ingratiate him to the culture, the team's culture, um, the speed and physicality of the G League and the NBA, and then hopefully in year two, kind of let him loose. So I, I know that everyone's always like, oh, well, you can just stash him for a year. It's like, well, you, you can, I, but I would rather bring him over and have, you know, get him in that team's developmental I think he's, organization. he's ready to come over and play i think a little bit i don't think you yeah. have to stash him i think he's ready no so. yeah i completely agree and i i think you'd do a disservice to him because you know that role in those minutes that we talked about earlier those coaches aren't going to be incentivized to play him because they know it's like okay well you're going to be gone soon so like what do i care so right. i i think just getting him over and then your developmental program as soon as possible is going to be really important because he, he's got so much to offer. I will be fascinated to see where he goes on draft night. I think if your Timberwolves yes. found a way to get him, you might faint out of excitement on the draft show. You might be, you might be out of commission for the rest of the show. Don't know if we can have that, but no, there'd be, a, there'd be a lot of fun places that, that he could go, especially in the second round. And he, he will be one of my more fascinating storylines under the radar storylines. I guess I could say for everybody who isn't as familiar with draft as you and I are, Where's Prachita going to end up going? Does he go in the first? Does he go somewhere in the second? And, and what happens with him? But fascinating player. The mm -hmm. last guy you wanted to talk about, I was very excited when you wanted to talk about Musa Diabate because why, why do I get the feeling that like 
you, Nick, and I are like the only people who talked about him in the No Sillings group chat like all year. And I know I didn't end up being probably as high on him as, as you ended up being, but like we had some moments like you and I would talk back and forth in the group chat. But like, why is nobody talking about Musa Diabate? And one of the main reasons why I wanted to have Matt Babcock on so early in the year was because they had him in like the first round of the basketball news board. And I was like, somebody else has taken notice of this kid. Really fascinating six foot 11 forward prospect. No, his body fat percentage probably isn't what it was shown to be. Well, from the what NBA was it like 2% conference. or something? Like 2.7%. Yeah. No, the kid, the kid would be on the ground dead. <laughs> if that was his real percentage, but really lean, really skinny, but man, does he pack a lot of natural talent in, in that frame that, all you need to do to see the upside as to what he could be is go back and watch the North Carolina game from earlier on in the year when he was literally taking that North Carolina team to task in the first like five, six minutes of the game, hitting fadeaway shots out of the post, being an aggressive scorer, running down the other end of the floor, blocking shots, rebounding. And he was an energy guy for Michigan all year when he got the opportunity. That's really the, the main selling point for him is that he's going to come in regardless of how many minutes he gets, he's going to work hard. He's going to hustle for the ball. He's going to dive. He's going to block shots, rebound, all that good stuff. He's got some touch though, man. And like he shot 54% from the field. He, he's got some touch on some of those shots. And I, I don't know who's going to take a swing on him. I really don't know who's going to end up drafting him, but he's a guy you don't really see in a lot of top forties on people's boards, but Metcalf, I, I don't think he's making it out of the top 40 in this draft. I think somebody's going to take a swing on him in, in the late twenties and in the thirties. And some people are going to be taken aback. Like, where did he come from? Like, why is he being drafted here? And people like you are going to be just smiling ear to ear. And are like, I, I tried to tell you this was going to happen months ago, but why is Musa Diabate one of your guys? Why do you like his game other than the fact that he was a Michigan player? And why should people be looking to maybe not be as surprised when they hear his name called possibly before the top 40? Um, yeah, I, I think he had the most impressive motor in the country this year. Yeah, the, the, the dude just never stopped working. Um, the downside to that is that he doesn't really know what he's doing on a basketball court yet. Um, the game is really fast for him, and it, you know, his processing speed is, is a little slow, but that just means he's What's that you know, phrase uh, that, that he's a long term in, in the hustle movie, a giraffe on roller skates. Is that what I just heard <laughs> in the hustle movie with Adam Sandler over the weekend? But go, go ahead. Um, I, mean, I, I love his rebounding. The The big selling point with him is just how versatile of a defender he could be. Um, yeah. You know, we, we talk about the BAM comparisons or the, the hopes with guys like Jalen Duran. Um, I, I think Diabate probably is more of that archetype. I, I think Diabate moves way better on the perimeter than Duran does. Um, and then he's really strong. The, the dude battles in the post. He moves his feet on the perimeter. I think he could be one of these guys who's switchable almost up and down the lineup. Obviously, there will be smaller point guards that he can't keep up with. But I think on a lot, a lot of wings, he's going to be able to switch pretty easily. He's he's not the same leaper as this guy, but is, is Precious Achua a little bit of a comp for him in terms of what you can see from him in the NBA down the road? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I, I think Precious was way more skilled than Diabate was in their first year, but that that approach to defense and rebounding and that that constant motor of yep. just always running um, is really similar. And then just physically, they're kind of have a, a similar build. Um, offensively, that that's going to be the big thing with him because he he can't shoot right now. Um, but he is incredibly effective as the pick and roll role man at 94th percentile. Um, really good leaper, really good rebounder. Um, so just as he adjusts to the NBA speed, um, it may take a year, it may take two. I think there's a really just nasty defender in there. And then yeah. anything you get, and then anything you get offensively is just a plus. D D. I, I know you you called out the shooting and I, I don't know if he'll ever be like a shooter either, but I, I think, do you, do you at least think he has the touch? Like, I think he has the touch in, in inside the paint to, to maybe whip out a little more than just like, you know, throwing down a dunk every now and then in the offensive. And I think there's some, there's some a little bit of skill to work with there, a little bit of touch to work with. Yeah. And it, it's tough because like, you know, one of the classic indicators, free throw percentage is only like 62%. So not ideal. Um, 
but he would have some like mid range pull ups or face ups that he would just knock down from 15 feet. It's like, oh, okay, like, where did that, that come that, from? <laughs> that looked nice. And then, you know, next possession, he would try it again and the form would be different and it clank off the backboard and miss a wrench. So I was like, Ugh. I think that's the okay. kind of player I would want him to be, though. I wouldn't want him stretching the floor. Yes. I think if he can get some of that stuff in his game, that makes him a lot more dangerous of an offensive threat. Yeah, if he can just kind of vary up his rolling game where instead of, you know, getting to the rim every time, it's, okay, a little Rashawn Holmes push shot here, a little, a little floater there, a yep. free throw exactly. line pull up, just yep. stuff like that to keep defenses on their toes because then from there, he has the athleticism and agility to, you know, maybe hit them with a spin move or something when they close out and then finish at the rim. So I my, my expectations for his offense are – are they're low okay i just want everyone to 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 hear that they're they're low but i think there are a lot of really interesting kind of areas that he could improve and build on that would really produce an effective player where would you take a swing on him in the draft so for most of the year i had him like right at the edge of the first round um he's in like my mid 30s right now so very very end of the first or you know depending on team or early second i think that's probably the range, be where man. i target them yeah. i really think that's the range and, and like i said i think it's going to surprise some people on draft night because they're going to be like i i didn't have musa diabate ranked this high at any point throughout the year but a really smart nba team is going to scoop him up in the top 40 and two to three years down the road could look really good when he's absolutely crashing the glass, hustling, playing his tail off, switching all over the place, being the versatile defender that you and I think he could be. And then maybe he's kicking in some offensive production too uh, in, in the scoring department. We'll, we'll see what happens with him. I'm, I'm also very intrigued to see where he goes in the draft. We, we talked about five guys, you, you outlined four guys, you even gave me an extra guy in there. Just, you know, let, let me have a little bit of the Mark Williams chatter, but is, is there anyone else? Because this is probably the last time I'm having you on before the 2022 NBA draft on June 23rd. Is there anybody else you would like to call out from this draft class who maybe you feel like should get a little more buzz, isn't getting enough buzz? Anybody else you would want to highlight? Um, I, you, you and I both really appreciate Malachi Branham's game. Yes, we do. Um, he's been talked about a ton. Ocharik Baji. I mean, I, I've been pumping this dude as a first round prospect since his freshman year when he couldn't shoot for shit. How and high would you take him? How, how how realistic? Like like he's been back out of the lottery like mid first a lot, but like there mm-hmm. there are some people who would take him in the top ten. Like I think um, Dan Purcell, who I had on, it's like I would take that guy as high as like nine or ten. I'm like, oh, I got, I, I don't know about that one, but like where would you take him? I know it would obviously depend as how the board fell, but like if he went to San Antonio at nine, I wouldn't hate it. It would surprise okay. me, and I'm not sure it'd be like great pick. Unless, you know, there it, again, it depends how the board falls, but I, I have him at like 15 right now. So anywhere or that back end of the lottery, I think it makes a lot of sense. The Does. dude's one of the best off ball scorers in the country. Uh, really good defender. I don't know why people think he just sucks at defense now. I don't know where that came from. That is um, that a thing? Is that a thing you're oh, seeing God, yeah. on social media? Yeah, all the time. I see, I see that he's, oh, well, like, why, why are you praising this guy? He sucks at defense. I'm like, you and I are watching very different games because that dude has been a really good defender since the day he set foot at Kansas. So I I love if I, go, if I go up in the search bar on Twitter and I type in Ochai Baji, am I going to see you in, in, in somebody's, you know, on somebody's thread just being like, what the hell are you talking about? Am I going to see it? No, no, because I, 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 I just ignore them at this point because uh, <laughs> I, I have better things to do with my day. Um, I agree. Who else? Um, and that, that, the, the, those are the big ones, at least compared to kind of where consensus has them. Um, yeah, man, I'm, I'm just excited for this draft. I, I'm getting a lot of kind of vibes from or similar vibes as like the Anthony Edwards draft where people were just kind of crapping on it yep. all the way up and, you know, looking forward to next year's draft before this one even happened. And I, I think there are going to be a lot of players that come out of this and surprise some people. I, I keep saying it. I've said it to everybody. I'm going to keep saying it that 25 to 40 range I'm telling you, man, there are going to be teams that strike gold. And by the way, I keep saying that yet guys we've talked about tonight, Max Christie, I have in that range. 
Musa Diabate, I have in that range. Gabriel Pachita, I have in that range. Like somebody's going to strike gold in that range. And I don't know how many teams and I don't know who are going to be the picks that, that, that makes some team, you know, the rich get richer, but I, I still really feel like they're, there may not be the same star power as some other drafts that we've evaluated over the last few years, but I think there's going to be some, some sneaky depth that takes place outside of like that lottery to mid first, like we see from a lot of drafts. I still feel that way. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. There, there's definitely talent to be had. And, you know, if they land, you know, the, so much of the draft is landing spot. It's for like that for all of them, a little more yeah. important for others, but if these teams, you know, really get things to click with these guys. I, I think there are going to be a lot of surprises, and I'm very excited to see some of the wild swings that could take in on draft night. Well, Metcalf, we're, we're almost at that wild ride. The, the journey's almost over for 2022, but thankfully you and I will be in the fold together with everybody else at No Ceilings for many more years to come. I'm so excited for all the content that we're going to keep pushing out. And one more thank you for everything you've done for no ceilings this year, repping the brand incredibly well, not just on the podcast front, but your Friday screeners that you put out on a consistent basis, basically every single Friday, they've all been top-notch content. And I encourage, I encourage everybody to go back and, and read some of Tyler's work on no if they haven't already, because I can promise you, you're going to learn something. I know that I did multiple times throughout the year. So just Tyler, give, give yourself one more plug for, for all of my audience. Where can they find you? Everything that you're doing. Well, I, I appreciate the kind words and having me on. This is a lot of fun. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at tmetcalf11. Um, all my written work at no ceilings, nba.com and the occasional Timberwolves pieces over at Canis Hoopus. Um, let's see. No Ceilings NBA Draft Podcast on Apple, Spotify, probably wherever you get it. I'm not really sure. Um, no Ceilings NBA dot big cartel dot com. Go check yes. out our merch and our draft guide. Uh, t- the clock is ticking. The support everyone's given us, it's overwhelming. We It's not going unnoticed or unappreciated. Uh, really means the world to us. Um, and the NBA Deep Dives podcast that I do with Nick Agar Johnson every Tuesday. And I'll have a Jaden Ivey Deep Dive coming out um, Tuesday with Maxwell Bombach and a whole big deep dive into Johnny Davis on Friday. Yes. Tyler has plenty more good things coming. Trust me, you want to be subscribed to NoSillingsNBA.com where you can find all of our written content and you get the blast. Even if you aren't subscribed, you still get the blast for when we post everything. If you're following NBA on Twitter, so please make sure you're doing that as well. Definitely make sure you're following me on Twitter at Draft Deeper. You can subscribe to the Draft Deeper podcast wherever you get your podcast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. Metcalf gave the biggest call out that I can do no ceilings nba.bigcartel.com go get that merch baby i i sent Corey a message for all the merch that i'm ordering listen right. i'm putting in a massive order all right i'm gonna be touting that shit everywhere i go on on draft night i hope we're all gonna be repping some stuff on the live stream i'm gonna be wearing all everything i can to the beach i'm gonna be shouting no ceilings everywhere i go because we've we put in the work all year long we we deserve to be able to pump our chest a little bit with that merch so if you want to be like us if you want to be one of the cool kids on the block go check out no ceilings nba that big cartel.com go get some merch some sweatshirts t-shirts shorts whatever you're into i'm i'm getting the flip-flops but that surprise you a little <laughs> bit i'm getting those damn flip-flops i'm gonna i'm gonna wear them on the beach and i'm gonna be there you go and, and, and in the morning, I'm going to be drinking coffee out of my nice no ceilings mug. So that Thanks. you can literally get whatever your heart desires at that shop. So please do so and show us some support. But until we meet again on this podcast front, thank you all for listening. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week.